Hello, I'm Justine Brown. Welcome back to my bookshelf. Uh, today we are talking about the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Who were the Pre-Raphaelites? In Desperate Romantics, the 2009 BBC series about this brilliant and prolific group of 19th century English artists, history is replayed as farce. The painters are portrayed as the ultimate big-shirted, prancing posers. They lead with their loins and are entirely at the mercy of their passions, spending so much time seducing models that it isn't clear how they ever get any painting done. The major exhibition at Tate Britain in 2012 marketed them as avant-garde Victorians, a designation which does have the merit of getting close to a powerful tension in their thought one which has proved immensely fruitful. It gave rise to the aesthetic and arts and crafts movements in turn. The Pre-Raphaelites were at once rebellious and wholly traditional, and their critique of modernity is more compelling than ever. In 1848, three young painters, William Holman Hunt, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and John Everett Millet, united in secret to denounce the Royal Academy's founding president, the artist Sir Joshua Reynolds. A statue of Reynolds stands in the courtyard of the Academy, located in Piccadilly, London. They disapproved of his style, dubbing him Sir Sloshua Slosh for his dark and indistinct backgrounds. But what they really detested in Reynolds was his advice. Reynolds had held that student painters should learn primarily by copying other painters. They were to model their work on specific old masters rather than painting from life. Hunt, Rossetti, and Millet, for their part, saw this as painting at one remove. They insisted upon what they called truth to nature, by which they meant that painters should respond directly to the subject unmediated by convention in the form of another painting. This, they claimed, would result in fresh and authentic artwork. The painters believed that art had abandoned this truth to nature about four centuries previously. After um, the Italian painter Raphael, they argued, art had become self-referential, hence artificial and derivative. It wasn't Raphael himself they blamed, actually, but his followers. They named themselves Pre-Raphaelites as a tribute to Raphael's predecessors, from medieval painters like Giotto through to Botticelli and Venetians like Titian and Tintoretto, whose vivid, jewel-like hues and detailed scenes and, and lively compositions they saw as being close to nature. Essential to Pre-Raphaelitism is the concept of the medieval era as a golden age when pure idealism held sway. In the name of this golden age, then, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was formed, albeit in secret. The three soon became seven. They pledged to sign their canvases with the initials PRB and wrote a simple manifesto. They vowed, one, to have genuine ideas to express, Two, to study nature attentively so as to know how to express them. Three, to sympathize with what is direct and serious and heartfelt in previous art to the exclusion of what is conventional and self-parading and learned by rote. And four, most indispensable of all, to produce thoroughly good pictures and statues. What makes Pre-Raphaelite paintings distinct and distinctly captivating is the juxtaposition of realistic technique with imaginative subjects drawn from literature, legend, and myth. More than any other school, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood saw painting as intertwined with poetry. They drew up a list of immortals, honored cultural figures and sources of inspiration, which featured more poets than painters. Rossetti was particularly insistent that they should be writing poetry as well as reading it. Together they founded a journal, The Germ, which featured poetry and essays together with engravings. Uh, Rossetti's sister, the poet Christina Rossetti, was a key contributor. Millet's Ophelia 
first exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1852, exemplifies this union of realism and the poetic. Here we see the tragic Shakespearean heroine, driven from madness to suicide, floating downstream in a soaking white dress and littered with the flowers of a posy. It illustrates the words of Hamlet's mother, Queen Gertrude. There is a willow, grows a slant of brook, that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come, of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples. Down the weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide, and mermaid-like a while they bore her up. Ophelia is an image of death and life, all the promise of a fruitful marriage, broken and drowned. It is also immensely detailed with the emerald bright greenery of an English forest in springtime. Millet spent days working in the Surrey countryside to produce this effect, layering nearly pure pigments over a white base for maximum luminosity. The picture is so vivid that we feel ourselves projected into the narrative. Ophelia is also typically pre-Raphaelite in that it was forged in an intense collaboration with the model. The young artists were always on the lookout for special women, they term these women stunners, whose regal beauty could inspire them to paint masterpieces. These were women fit to represent the great heroines of our tradition, the Marys, Persephones, and Guinevere's. Without the right subjects, there could be no perfect paintings. It is tempting to view this quest with cynical eyes, but men like Millet and Rossetti were actually very good at inspiring their stunners in turn, getting a remarkable level of commitment to the creation of artwork at a time when art modeling was far from prestigious. The models were made to feel how crucial they were in the whole enterprise. One said, looking back on her experience, I never saw such men. It was being in a new world to be with them. And I was a holy thing to them. I was a holy thing. The Ophelia model, the 19-year-old red-headed Elizabeth Siddle, risked her well-being to ensure that Millet's vision was realized, spending countless hours lying immobile in tepid bathwater. The result was that she caught a cold so violent that her father, ignoring Lizzie's protests, demanded compensation. It is difficult to overstate the importance of women like Lizzie Siddle for pre-Raphaelitism. The poetic nature of the movement entailed the concept of the poetic muses, goddesses of Greek mythology who sing through, nay possess, the artist. He becomes the medium and she inspires him filling him with spirit. It is a vision of complementarity. Lizzie inspired Millet and others, none more so than Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Dante, who strongly identified with his namesake, knew his Beatrice when he saw her. Rossetti embarked on a massive series of drawings and paintings in an effort to capture Lizzie's essence. The two fell in love, and Lizzie, for her part, began writing ballads and illustrating them in paint. Although their love was a troubled one, Lizzie, a depressive laudanum addict, was frequently bedridden, and the two were often at loggerheads. It, it was immensely productive, artistically. And Lizzie's presence continued to inspire various members of the movement. These lines from Christina Rossetti's poem, In an Artist's Studio, depicts her brother's intense response to his muse. One face looks out from all his canvases. One self-same figure sits or walks or leans. We found her hidden just behind those screens. That mirror gave back all her loveliness. A queen in opal or in ruby dress. A nameless girl in freshest summer greens. A saint or angel. Every canvas means the same one meaning, neither more nor less. He feeds upon her face both day and night, and she with true kind eyes looks back on him, fair as the moon and joyful as the light. 
not wan with waiting, not with sorrow dim, not as she is, but was when hope shone bright, not as she is, but as she fills his dream. If Lizzie Siddle embodies early Pre-Raphaelitism, Jane Morris, nay Burden, personifies its full flowering. This particular stunner was spotted in an Oxford audience by Rossetti and Edward Byrne Jones, who had lately joined the movement together with William Morris. The year was 1857 and Jane was 17. The daughter of a stableman and a washerwoman, Jane was surprised and at first hesitant when invited to pose. Lanky and pallid, with curly black hair and pronounced features, Jane had never been considered pretty, and indeed the word pretty does not do justice to her powerful face. Rossetti cast her as Arthur's queen, Guinevere, while William Morris painted her as Isolt. Jane responded by metamorphosing, accent, manners, skills, and interests, as if to narrow the gap between herself and her painted image. The, her participation in the creative process brought out the best in her. She is thought to have been the model for George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, also known as My Fair Lady, the story of an urchin molded into a lady and a man who falls in love with his own creation. Jane and William Morris married, and their wonderfully decorated home, Rossetti termed it more a poem than a house, became the centre of pre-Raphaelite court life. The imaginative, medievalizing flank of the movement had moved to the fore. The style was vivid rather than realistic, underscoring the idea that much had been lost with the medieval age, Morris, in particular, was developing a kind of golden age utopianism. A happy future could be brought about only by recovering elements of Europe's past, he argued. It was a corrective to the industrial age, to mechanization, pollution, and mass production, to di disenchantment. A champion of the artisan, Morris brought the pre-Raphaelite vision to everyday life. He went on to dis design fabric, soft furnishings, wallpaper and books, and more, believing that ordinary people would flourish in beautiful surroundings. The Pre-Raphaelites began as a small secret society, but their unofficial numbers are huge, encompassing models, poets, critics, and other artists such as Waterhouse, Evelyn de Morgan, and Aubrey Beardsley, who felt their influence strongly. Together they produced some of the most important artwork of the 19th century. Their approach, which invokes and then tweaks dormant tradition, thereby reviving it, remains one of the best available to us. For our past is not dead. It's merely dozing. Thank you for listening, and please do subscribe, like this video, and I invite your comments below.